I'm WFAE's David Borax, and this is R&D in the QC. Tarek Bakari and Larkin Eggleston, one Republican and one Democrat who bonded as first-term Charlotte City Council members. Somehow, they both got re-elected, and now we're stuck listening to another season of this amateur hour bullshit. In the first 82 episodes, they talked to a governor, a senator, presidential candidates, and even a journalist or two. Their goal again this season, bringing Charlotte listeners behind the scenes of the City Council in one of America's fastest-growing cities. I won't be listening, but for some reason, you are... R&D in the QC, episode 103. We talk about last night's rezoning meeting, and we play catch-up on the last few weeks since our most recent episode. Catch-up! That's right, folks. Episode 103. Larkin? 103. 103. Everyone knows that's the number in podcasting where true magic happens and greatness is achieved. Unlikely. Larkin, this one th- yes. once a month podcast schedule is strenuous, my friend. Yeah, it is. It is odd not doing these the way we used to do them. Um, I'll tell you something, though. I honestly, and I should knock on wood right now. Um, I honestly, like, I have felt, like, terrible mentally, emotionally, and physically for the last several months. And... I feel like I'm starting to slowly get back to like feeling normal. Honestly, I think there was just such like a deep depression that had swept over me that I was like, I just don't feel like doing a podcast. And I look at you, you were just waiting for an excuse not to do one one each week. So let's get back to it now. What do you say? All right, well, buckle down. I know, I think buckle there's been a, a malaise on all of us across the country, mm. probably the world this year. Probably definitely um, Charlotte. And you, and, you, and you looked like hell. I could tell that something was wrong with you. Look at, look at me now, dude. I know. You look like a vagabond. Like you just walked off the train tracks with like a stick and a little uh, is there a difference bandana full of your belongings over your shoulder. I understand that it is a vagabond, but I, for some reason I, I used to think it was a vagabond. What is a vagabond? Is that not a thing? A thing, a thing you made up. A, I bet you there's, there's a good chunk of people that are like, oh, it's a vagabond. No. You want to know what my mine was? I used to think that a chest of drawers was a chest of drawers. Chest of drawers. Oh, yeah, dude, like, I, yeah, that's pretty good. I had a, I had the best. And by, by, I used to think that. I mean, like up until like five years ago. Yeah, I, I had one that it was five, like about five years ago that I learned too. And I said it, I, I used to say it all the time, and I said it in a meeting, and and I think my wife came up to me afterwards and was like, um. God. Oh, I, here's a uh, uh, intent. Oh, so all in, what is it? All intents? For all intents and purposes. I used to think and you were saying like, intensive purposes. Intensive purposes. <laughs> uh, it made sense to me. I was like, for all intensive purposes. Okay. Which is or like, these are intense, intense purposes. This is real. This is real. Well, I'm glad yeah. we got that out of the way. Yeah. What's going there's, on? Also still, there's also still a word I can't say. Madden? I, I cannot, my mouth cannot form the word. Cor- corroborate corroborate carabas corroborate it's when you I, go to I, carabas and I you, don't know and you eat a lot i'm told um, i cannot i'm told i i am physically incapable of saying it correctly i have tried capable that's a word seems you can't say either now speaking of hard words like madame <laughs> what happened last night we had a rezoning meeting and for the record vi can now mayor Lyles can now say Madame Holmes. She said it wrong. She she did say it quickly wrong, and then she corrected herself. But she got it right eventually. The Tommy, Matt. Her her wrong her wrong version was a different wrong version than it used to be. It's good. Uh, she tries to remember it now by remembering Matt Amy, except that's not how you pronounce Madame. Matt Amy. Matt Amy Holmes. Um, that one wasn't particularly interesting, I don't think. But no offense to Matt Amy Holmes, but we did have a couple uh, of interesting ones, including. Several decisions in my district, um, one of which I got to use my favorite phrase uh, between you and I, one of our little inside jokes in an email that I sent, which was, that's not how this works. Oh, your favorite. Your favorite. So we had a, uh, we had a rezoning where the neighbors were fighting it primarily because of a connection that it made from one street to another. They were worried about the traffic that might cause, and uh, the petitioner ultimately took it out. But we had emails from folks saying, well, 
they say they're going to take it out, but they're probably, they'll probably try to put it back in there later. So update for anyone who hasn't listened to the podcast long enough to know, but the whole point of these rezonings is we get commitments. They agree to a specific plan. Uh, most probably 85 to 95% of any given month are conditional rezonings as opposed to conventional rezonings. A conventional rezoning means there is not a plan. They're just switching the zoning district and, um, and can do anything allowable in that zoning district. A conditional uh, rezoning means that they have to present us a plan and then they literally have to build that plan. And if they want to do something different than that plan, they'd have to rezone it again. So if they say they're not putting something into a rezoning plan uh, and they don't on the one that we vote on, they cannot then later build it uh, some other way. So uh, thank you for that 101 council member. Uh, the we group, used to explain folks. things to people. Yeah, and I, also, I feel like we've gotten away explainer. from that too. You're the explainer. I get it. Before we go to what was arguably probably the most contentious and the, the, the largest highest profile one, let's start with the one you nerded out on and the rest of us had to sit there. Well, to be fair, I, I managed to keep my nerding out to like 10 or 15 minutes as opposed to, and it probably wasn't even that, as opposed to, you're, you're looking like I'm wrong. I'll go back and actually That's check it. a long time, dude. Because <laughs> I guarantee it wasn't 15 minutes. Um, as opposed to the one you're, you're going to bring up, which was not your fault, I'll admit, but uh, lasted for at least an hour and a half. Was there any, was there any thought that it was my fault? No, but I'm just, I'm not just blaming you for the audience. I'm sounding accusatory. Let's talk I'm sounding about your nerdy one first, okay? All right, so the Shaw House, the home of former Charlotte Mayor Victor Shaw, um, is over near Charlotte Country Club, near the corner of Mecklenburg and Matheson, and in, in the Plaza Midwood neighborhood. And it was it had an appropriate uh, certificate for appropriateness to be torn down a year or two ago. Preserve Mecklenburg, which is a private group led by Dan Morrill, who used to be the executive director of the Historic Landmarks Commission, got involved, um, found some some private folks that were willing to develop other the other portions of that site and save the historic home. Um, I met with them really early on, probably a year or two ago about this and was excited about the idea. But we had, um, we had a couple of emails yesterday, or I did at least. There's the home, the Victor Shaw home. I, you know, I was surprised you didn't pick up on this. I, I didn't want to uh, degrade the seriousness of my commentary on that one because I'm, I'm genuinely concerned about that one. But looks the same as my house. Is my house historic? No, it's not. Never will be. I um back in 1992 this was built I was surprised you didn't bring up the fact that Mayor Shaw as it was told to us proposed that Charlotte have a zoo and I felt like that was something you were going to latch on to and like make a joke I heard I listen I wanted to trust me I remember that moment what was it there was something about a zebra or a tiger nope it elephant? was an elephant yep elephant and, and here's what I thought was going to happen. I thought Tar's going to make a joke. The about, zoo people were going after me, dude. Not, they're, well, not, they're not zoo people. They're circus people. But uh, if I thought you were going to make it. They'd be zoo people. Okay. <laughs> I think zoos are not necessarily viewed as, as, uh, as angrily as circuses. I, would you I would like assume. to make a gamble on that statement, Mr. Eggleston? No, I wouldn't, which is why I didn't make the joke. And I thought you were going to come in with an elephant joke. And that we, this was going to open up that can of worms again. There's not a lot of zoo people in Charlotte simply because we don't have a zoo. I think we need to be real clear on that. Yet. Yet. I think, I think one of us needs to bring that back up as a campaign issue. The Charlotte Zoo. Oh, my gosh. I really like that. I hope none of those uh, kind, great folks are uh, listeners of this podcast. So, so for all our friends who are activists against the circus, please let us know in advance if zoos are problematic the way circuses are so that we don't avoid that, uh, that pitfall. R&D in the QC, uh, episode 103, poll of the week, are zoos on okay. the same level of cir as circuses? Are zoos okay? Zoos. Do you hate them? Zoos. So... Um, so we had someone come in and I like to, on most of these rezoning meetings, at least once per rezoning meeting, see if I can't alienate a couple of my constituents and lose their votes permanently. So last night I decided to do that with some of the people who, uh, a husband and wife who came to oppose this rezoning, uh, on the basis of its density, which was going from what's already allowable there, three units per acre to 
the proposed plan would be 3.71 units per acre. And we're only talking about like a three acre site. So the difference between like 11 houses versus eight. So density to me didn't really hold any water. Um, and then one of them said, you know, we don't, we're, we've not done any of this anywhere else where we increase the density on a site to save a historic home. These people live, I'm going to ballpark 300 yards from where we just did literally the exact same thing in the last two years, which I pointed out to them. Yeah, but if you say it didn't happen. They also then said, and this was the one that kind of pissed me off. Like if don't, and I'm going to, I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt and assume that they, there was a misunderstanding, but I'm, I'm not sure that's what it was. They came in and said, the Plaza Midwood land use group opposes this rezoning, which I had not heard. So I texted one of the members of said group and he said, no, we didn't oppose it, which I then pointed that out to them as well. So don't come into these hearings if you don't have your facts straight, uh, especially if it's in my district and especially if it's about historic preservation, um, because I will make you not like me. You're on a maybe, roll. Maybe they, didn't, maybe they already didn't like me. That, that would be uh, I mean, you've already too. alienated the zoo people and now this group. Good job. Only, Good job. Only if you're correct that people hate zoos the way they hate circuses. And I'm not sure that's the case. I, <laughs> I got a real strong heart. I think okay. if you're an animal in a zoo, you probably have a lot better living conditions than on those tight train cars for the circus. So you think this 1993 house is going gonna, is gonna to withstand the test of time? It's going to make it through all this? I think your house is sturdy. I think it will survive. Just no one will care enough to put a plaque or, or any sort of designation. Well, not my house. I'm talking about the 1993 one you were, you're, you're, you're saving here. Oh, was that not the year it was built? It was built it like... pretty new, dude. I just showed the picture of it. It was I mean, built like 80 years ago. 80? Wow. The guy, he lived, he lived in it. He was mayor like 80 years ago. Why didn't anyone think to turn that plot into a zoo? That thought crossed my mind and I thought, you know, instead of these other houses, maybe we save the house and build a zoo around it. A district it, one, do we built a zoo kind of movie vibe? You haven't seen that, I'm sure. No, but I'm assuming it's a Jumanji reference. No, it's a movie called We Built a Zoo. <laughs> but, oh. but, but cool. Um, I Jumanji like that had, Jumanji like, zoo animals, theme right? kind of area there. Well, that's great, Larkin. Congratulations. More good work done on the historical preservation front. And a zoo? Maybe on the way, depending on the results of this week's poll. We could, we could do it in a new style called adaptive zoo use. Adaptive re-zooing. Re <laughs> adaptive re-zooing. <laughs> <laughs> ah, yes. So let's go to the other one that actually uh, was controversial in a significant And not in the city of Charlotte. Not in the city of Charlotte. Yes, there was a lot of pandering by, by people to constituents that cannot vote for them. I'm not sure they realize that. I mean, no, so no, no, to to be, everyone. No, to be, no, to be transparent, I did ask Victoria afterwards, um, and she said, well, several to many of the people who were lobbying against this live just on the other side of whatever road, and, and they are Charlotte um, citizens. So... I'm uh, kidding for any But I will say it is odd to me in some of these situations where we are asked to make decisions on rezonings that are outside of our jurisdiction and the people oftentimes who are impacted by those can't vote for us or vote against us. And so it is an odd circumstance that um, now, you know, I think in the past there'd been some talk of letting the county commission do those, but they don't do rezonings on a regular basis. So that might be unwieldy for them to try to, to pick that up every now and again. Uh, but it just doesn't seem like a perfect system when there's not the voter accountability on some of these decisions we make outside of city limits. Yes, I agree on that. And I also agree with the fact that it's difficult to pander as many, like, you know, oh my God, here you are. And then you're like, but you don't vote for me. I feel like there's a dichotomy with several people's approach with that. It's time for zoning quiz show. Larkin, your edition. Do not look. Take your eyes away from the paper. This is in honor of Warren. You think Cooksey. I have all that stuff in front of me right no, now? No, I don't. This is in honor of Warren Cooksey. I, this game came to me just now. Feels like a Warren Cooksey game. I am going to say 
For those who don't E-letters. know, former District 7 Republican Council member and now member or uh, employee of the North Carolina DOT. Thank you. We're back to explaining things. I love it. I'm going to say the acronym letters of the current zoning to the proposed zoning, and we're going to see how many of those you can get because this is a good one. Current zoning R3 LWPA LWCA going to a proposed zoning of I2C. All right, hold on. Let's choose one at a time. LWPA LWCA. That's it. All right, well, R3, R3 is obviously residential, R3, three units per acre. Three units per acre. LWPA? Uh, Lake Wiley Protected Area. LWCA. I'm going to assume it's... I think Warren might have trouble with this one, to be Lake honest. Wa- LWCA? Yep. Lake Wiley Containment Area? Critical Area Containment Critical Area. area. Yeah, I didn't know like that Some kind of like nuclear plant problem happened there. And it's going to, you already got the back end, so I2CD. Yeah, well, that's industrial too, uh, which is, I believe, the light industrial designation conditional. That's right. General industrial conditional. Oh, so I1 is light industrial. Then. So this one is approximately 156 acres. It's on the south side of Interstate 85, east of Moore's Chapel Road, north of Wilkinson Boulevard, and they want to take it to, uh, again, general industrial conditional to allow the development of over 1.5 million square feet of industrial development. Um, the Which they project- told us last night is, is, where, is going to be a warehouse use, and it is, it's right between the airport and the Catawba River. Well, it could be, as we heard, but depending on who they sign, a mixture of both warehouse could have some light manufacturing, I think. Interesting point is that the property owner name and project code name is Square Grooves LLC. Square Grooves. Also, an interesting point. I don't know any inside information. I actually got this from somebody who was asking questions about it. Um, but um, there is someone who is listed in that and the code name is interesting where is it it has touch points to the um to the furniture industry whether it is a furniture oh, yeah. related thing or not i don't know but the person's name i think the observer article today said that as well with the person's name and what they're associated with but the keith corporation the keith corp a great local company um we we know we've known we've known many of them for a long time is trying to do this and I think it's a mixture on one side of the coin of amazing opportunity for economic development and impact to our community. It's something where we know I coined it yesterday. I'll say I coined it, if you don't mind. Uh, It's really industrial gentrification that we have done to South End, to these areas where it's cool, it's hot to get, you know, lofts and breweries and things in these old warehouses. The problem is you don't have anywhere for the actual warehouses to be. Um, so that's on one side of the coin, a great opportunity. On the other side, and I have feelings for them as well, nobody wants to live near anything like this, even if it's just a perception thing and you don't see it directly, or if it starts to impact you in traffic and noise or whatever, nobody wants it. So it begs the question, like if we've gentrified them out of where they were, are we going to allow them to be around? Is this a logical area? To me, it kind of seems like it. We're going to get some follow-ups. Uh, but needless to say, there are a lot of neighbors that are not pleased that this is the the idea in the area for it. What would your take, Larkin? Yeah, I think that, and I, and I was looking for a term that I couldn't find last night, and I think it was Dave Petten from our planning staff that used the term noxious industrial. So, I mean, what you obviously don't want most is something where they're like, crushing up stone and there's dust coming across your property or their smokestacks where they're blowing out some sort of a noxious gas or something. So this is not that, but I think even still to your point about noise impacts, you'd have all sorts of large trucks coming through the area. I mean, which you do already to some extent, but we have, we have taken not only in South end, but also in the North end, there's a lot of industrial up that way that's being converted um, into arguably higher and better uses. And yet, We, I don't remember, it was probably a year or two ago when the council had this discussion, the last council, about how we're losing so much industrial um, space in our community, and that there is some amount of that that we really need for our economy to thrive. And so, where where better, I mean, you know, you could theoretically say, we'll just have it in the surrounding counties, but some of it needs to be more proximate to things like the airport where we have the intermodal yard now, it needs to be proximate to highways, and this is right near the, the, um, 
where it generates, an 85 million. It generates jobs. Like why? Yeah. You don't just so, say, oh, we're going to punt on that and we're going to be the suburbs and we will outsource all of our economic future, essentially. That's, that, that would be stupid. Well, I don't think it's, I don't think it's that extreme, but I do think that there's got, we've got to have that. And I think there's probably not many better places than having it near airport intersection of two interstates and the intermodal yard. And yet there are people who have lived out in that part of West Charlotte um, near the airport, near Morse Chapel Road, uh, right there on the Catawba River, who've lived there for, for generations. And so, you know, yes, they live near the airport, though I bet a lot of those homes I actually pulled up just kind of anecdotally on GIS last night, pulled up and some of those homes hadn't have been owned by the same people for 30, 40 years. So the airport back then wasn't what it is now. There wasn't the intermodal yard out there. There wasn't 45 or even a plan for 45. So, you know, to say, well, you live near the airport, of course, you're going to have a lot of this kind of stuff. That might or might not have been the case when they bought their house in 1980. So 40 or 50 years ago, where I'm living in South Park was a cow pasture almost. I mean, you know, it's like it still kind of feels that way. It, it's, yeah, sure. Um, but I think I think there has to be a level of understanding that if we we are either gonna gonna say we are not going to have industrial kind of especially like I'd love the example of not just in in time type of, of manufacturing and warehousing and logistics, but just in case that we're seeing with literally like on, on Amazon, my, my wife, like she thinks of something and it arrives in the mailbox like within three hours. So like, this is the new world. So if we wanna go into an old world of either, we're gonna you know, have the kind of just in time um, uh, warehousing model and logistics model where that industry is dying and that won't last, or we're not gonna have the industry at all. Sure, let's have that discussion. But I think we're all probably going to end up agreeing like, yeah, we wanna be in this space. Yeah, we wanna be in these intermodal type transit businesses. And in which case we gotta have a discussion, where does this go? I can't imagine a part of town that's probably more suited for this. And if you bought in, in South Park 50 years ago, it's probably not the same thing. And that doesn't mean that we can stop what's happening in South Park yeah. any more than we be can sensitive stop to the people. Oh yeah. yeah, of course. But like not overly that, sensitive and not giving them false impressions that in 30 days, we're gonna create a new process and a new way of thinking about all this, that they, it's binary to them. Either don't do it, which is what I want you to do, or you're going to do it and I'm going to be mad at you. And I think it would, have, it would have served them better had we all said, look, I feel, because I feel like we are going to lean towards approving this and based on, and that's with a grain of salt, depending on what we find out from staff and the follow-ups. Staff is supportive of it. Well, I was going to say, we're, we're not going to find out too much damning about it because if there was something that damning about it, they would have been that. in support of it in the first place. And that's what annoyed me about uh, how we approach them. And that's when I said pandering, like, oh, I have all these concerns and questions. We've done this long enough to know damn well that there probably isn't some smoking gun out there that's going to be like, yeah, let's not do it. Getting a list of where else could this be at this stage isn't going to happen. Which, so which also presumed that these, it, the ask was made to find other sites in that area uh, where they could build more than a million square feet. The, the detail that was left out of that ask was the site also has to be for sale. Yeah. <laughs> And they have to have already planned and gotten to a design like they already have. There's not tons of 150 acre parcels laying around for sale. And if you do that, then there's just going to be another subset of angry neighbors. I mean, like this is, so I feel like people are smart enough and, and savvy enough. If you tell them, Hey, there's a good chance that this is going to be approved. So rather than fight tooth and nail to say, don't approve it, let's get to the part where we start to say, what concessions would make this better for you guys? Or how do we mitigate some of the impacts with exactly. screening and with buffers? And with, it yeah. is a disservice to the constituents by that kind of pandering happening. Yeah. And one of the things that I don't think, and maybe even you and I don't to some degree, but I don't think the average person in Charlotte understands the significance of that intermodal yard. I mean, it is literally considered an inland port. Now, I don't know specifically what the potential tenant they've got lined up for this, if, if most of their um, cargo would be coming in via, you know, train car, or if it'd be coming in via, you know, tractor trailer or what, but I just mean, the intermodal yard was not, was not built out there. Um, 
it wasn't really, I think a lot of people, myself included early on, thought, oh, you build it near the airport and there's transfer between planes and, and trains. There's actually not a lot of that. It was built there because of its proximity to 485 and 85. But it is an inland port and it is a huge economic driver for the city. Hold on, does that state. mean, I, I, I did, I don't know if I knew that. I, I, I knew there was a piece of that. I also, maybe incorrectly, was under the premise that it also, when you look at like, an Amazon or anyone that's like going to set up also like a, a thing there and fly it in, they can fly it in and have a proximity of several hundred miles where they are doing those transfers. Are you saying that doesn't happen hardly at all or it's. I just mean that the, the need to have the, the intermodal yard there for the trains was not necessarily that there's a lot of cargo going from a train to a plane or a plane to a train. I think that's just where there was the land and the space to build it. And it made sense because of where it was with the highways I think there is some oh, right. crossover with, uh, with air freight. But anyway, the point is that that intermodal yard was built there with the intent of building up this sort of, this sort of economic ecosystem in that area. And so you didn't, you didn't invest all that money for the state of North Carolina. Uh, and I don't know exactly how the investment was split there, but I think it was mostly a state project. You don't invest that kind of money to not then add on to your warehousing space and your, your light industrial space and, and take advantage of it. So I think this is an inevitable um, trajectory we're on. And I, I certainly can appreciate the, but again, I think to your point, we've got to be more focused on what impacts will it have and how can we mitigate those while not, um, while not just arbitrarily trying to, to deny this petition and eliminate all of the economic opportunity and jobs that it could create. I, I just, my, my approach in the last three years is I've kind of learned how, my style of dealing with rezonings and, and constituents, community members is have compassion, pretend like it's happening in your backyard personally and, and feel, and my wife really helped in the early days with my compassion side. You know how deeply compassionate I am. Um, she's like, pretend it's happening to us. Like really don't, don't just come in there. And, All right, so step I, one, don't be a jerk. Don't be a jerk. Number one. Right. So yeah. But then, so, but I combine that equally as, as much as I can with, with no nonsense, being a jerk, just like, Hey, like, I don't want to give you a false impression. So I lead you along and waste the, the limited time you have to achieve change, right. To achieve concessions and 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 negotiations. And even if people don't like that in the moment i think they respect i think they respect it more long term because and i, I try to do the same thing i met with some neighbors a couple of weeks ago about a, a rezoning petition and that we approved last night and they had four or five things they're concerned about and i told them flat out one of them was just a non-starter i mean it's like why waste time talking about something that you know is not actually going to change instead of focusing on the two or three or four things that that can be changed and can help them um I, don't I, bet know. You, it's, it's, I bet you most of those community members walked away last night thinking, oh, there are one or two tops council members that support this, but there's a bunch that have serious, serious questions. And, you know, and so they're going to sit back there and say, all right, let's, and I'm telling you, it, they're going to be frustrated for the next week. Uh, cause they're, they're going to be like, Oh, and then their frustration is going to build until they're like, Oh my gosh, is this going to pass? And it's going to pass. And all of a sudden they wasted like three weeks and there's going to be a mad dash at the last week to say, well, how about this one thing when they could be. Although doing it now? I, I do have some faith that, um, it's not in the city limits, but it is adjacent to district three. And I think Victoria is going to run point on the dialogue between the neighbors. And so she is a, a pretty detail oriented person who, in my experience, will will be a straight shooter and say, you know, here's this thing. This thing looks like it's probably on track to pass. That doesn't mean we can't improve it. Let's figure out what your concerns are and figure out how we can address them. Yep. So I, I think with her leading that process, I think they'll get somewhere. But um, but yeah, I mean, I I'm with you unless there's some huge surprise that would be a would be a surprise. What's a huge her. surprise? Zoning committee comes out and unanimously says, yeah, this is bad, right? But I I don't. I, yeah. that would be a, a real surprise to me. So, yeah, I don't, I don't think if, if their hope is, okay, this thing's going to fail and it's just going to be developed as three houses per acre on 150 acres. That's, that's probably not the outcome. All right, we've beaten that horse to death. Zoning, everyone. Get to it. Get used to it. It is sexy. It is real. And it is 98% of city council. Um, 
Last the point. other 2% is arguing over whether we have those meetings in person or virtually. Great transition. God, the transitions here are, I mean, who would, th you would have thought we've been doing podcast each week, man. This is seamless. This is professional. Once you've done 102 and a half now, you know, just. This is just Thompson flows. quality. Let's start calling it Thompson quality. It's I don't know either, what that means. It's either uh, Ben Thompson or Bo Thompson. Quality transitions. I'll take Ben. I'll take Bo. You hear that, Ben? No, I'll take Ben too. <laughs> All right, listen. Um, uh, so what, half how of us describe this. Well, so last night's meeting. If you've watched the last couple of meetings for a long time, for months, obviously it was just give Bear it to Lyles, us straight, Larkin. Give it to our audience staff, straight. And the rest of us were sitting at home, like Tark and I are doing, right where we're sitting right now. Really? Um, two, three weeks ago, we had an in-person meeting, and I think. Maybe all but one member was there. Last week we had an in-person meeting and maybe all but three members were there. Last night it was like a 50-50 split. Um, the reason we'd started having virtual meetings was because with the number of us that there are, 11 plus the mayor, 12 people plus obviously there's support staff involved, we couldn't under North Carolina guidelines have an in-person meeting. It would have been more than the 10-person indoor gathering limit that the state had set. So we legally could not have had our council meetings in person for that time. That obviously has changed now. It's 25 people. Um, they are limiting the number of staff that are at these meetings. They have put us all at our own six foot table um, where we used to sit two to a table. So we are socially distanced. We're wearing masks during the meeting. Um, precautions are being taken. And, but we've, we've heard from some of our colleagues that they don't feel comfortable or don't want to come back to in-person meetings. Um, that has turned into a bit of a spat between different factions of, of the 12 of us. And I, you know, it's, I respect, and you know, I'm, I still think, you know, we need to be taking precautions. In fact, I kind of laugh because some people at these meetings, when they talk, they'll lower their mask. It's like, that's not how masks work. I've, I leave my mask on the whole time unless I'm eating or drinking, if I'm getting up and moving. And I mean, I think so most people are taking it seriously. On, hardly at all is what you're saying. <laughs> huh? So you always have your mask off. Well, right. I like to eat and drink. Um, you know, I, I think we have to be respectful of people's concerns and, and the pandemic. I saw some post on Facebook the other day that I actually thought was apropos. It said the pandemic's not over just because you're over it. And I get that we're all over it, but it is still something we need to take seriously. I think city staff is taking it seriously. We're minimizing the number of people that are in the government center, We're making sure there's social distancing um, but two, I, you know, I think we've seen people doing other, th other activities around folks. It, it, can you pick and choose? Like if you're going to say, this is a big concern for me, then be concerned all the time. Would you like to give examples? <laughs> like I'm not, you know, it's not, it's not personal. Like it's, it's just that, like, you that, can't no, that, really it, have it both ways. You have nailed one of the Republican frustrations of the last six months, which is it's like lockdown business and small business and you can't do anything or, you know, schools can't go back. But actual, like, 100% support and championing of protest, of which – many people didn't have masks because I was there. You know what I mean? So like that consistency isn't just for this. It's for everything. Now, with that being said, though, I'm sure, go ahead, argue that. Point. Well, no, I, I just was going to say, I mean, on, on protest, protests are not by their nature. They're not sanctioned or unsanctioned. They are, I mean, well, I guess they, by their nature, they are unsanctioned. When the we point see is Governor Cooper hold up saying no, 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 no. And then he comes out. And I know it probably wasn't overly fair, but they got a picture of him taking his mask off, showing his face shoulder to shoulder with the protesters. That was literally the only time he came out. It just rubbed many of us the wrong way. Yeah. And I think, and I, I will say like, and I'm a staunch supporter of the governor. I think he and, and Secretary Cohen have done a good job with this in general. There are things they've done I disagreed with. I mean, I think there is a difference between being able to have you know, 5,000 people in the Spectrum Center for a basketball game than have 
5,000 people or even 15,000 people at a Panthers game because it's outdoors. And so, you know, outdoors is, is significantly different than being indoors. So there's no right answer. And I don't think, and, you know, I did appreciate, and we can talk about it a little bit if you want later, but you and uh, Councilmember Winston put out a statement basically in support of CMS before they made their decision, acknowledging that this is all hard and there's not a, there's not a, there's not an easy answer. There's not a right answer. Whatever answer you come up with, half the people are going to hate it at, at best. Um, and so, you know, I give, I give some, some grace for that. I just, to me, I feel like the meeting thing has become something more than just about meetings and about COVID. Well, that, I think that's, and that's the, the punchline, I think, to all of it. On one side of this coin, you have the safety issues. And look, I, uh, I, I won't repeat what you've said. I'm kind of there, uh, and, and, I, and, uh, but not so much as I think it's been taken in, in some other contexts. But let's just say, yes, totally agreed, but protocols need to be followed. And if they are, it's, it's a pretty good mitigant. On the other side of this coin, though, I think the real argument here that some folks are championing tr as they attempt to bring us back and cancel all remote connectivity is just the level of dysfunction we have had over the last six months. And I honestly, like, you know, I, I, I would wager that we have all learned at least one thing, if not multiple things about ourselves, about our, our tenets and principles that, of operating in business and politics and whatever it is. And what, one of those items for me um, is that I always before March believed that all of this stuff could be done remotely. I thought it was I, like, whether it was Raleigh or city council or freaking business, I, I always thought like, I don't need to fly to New York. I don't need to go, to go to London for a meeting. I don't need to drive to Raleigh for the general assembly. Like it could be done. We are technologically advanced enough to do it. And, and I think I learned a valuable lesson, which is you lose something. And maybe that doesn't apply to everybody. I'm still a big advocate of remote working, uh, remote learning opportunities, things like that. But there are some things that work and there are some things that don't. And I think it's just a powder keg of depending on what ingredients, what people are in there as to how successful it can be. But we, we had a, a mixture of, of a you know, dynamite stick of, of tough topics that we were dealing with simultaneously. Some people that were honestly maybe not always operating in good faith and we didn't have opportunities to physically see each other. We only saw each other on screens like this, which not only made people more comfortable to maybe go a little crazy or get, you know, talking points from somebody off the screen, but it also prevented the people who probably would have been unified against those things or would have been the, the challenge and, the, and the, the control against it from running into each other in their offices or in the hallways before the meeting, talking about it, getting ramped up and being able to defend it. And I believe that was, everyone probably has different opinions on who and which ingredients or whatever. I believe that was the ingredient set that has made the last six months of largely embarrassment um, for all of us. And I'm knocking on wood saying, man, I, I feel like maybe we're starting to hopefully turn a corner. I mean, there's still a lot to figure out. And clearly the fact that we were at a point where we were gonna go back, it was gonna, and I, it's my opinion personally, not based on anything else, that that was the reason. This would set us back to a path of working together and building coalitions on topics and, and stopping the insanity. And there was an immense amount of pushback. In my opinion, opinion based on the point you said earlier um, of what other people deem as it's okay to do versus this, there was more to it than just safety and health. Yeah, I just had to... I fill out a questionnaire about myself or something a week or two ago. And one of the questions was, what have you learned about yourself in 2020? And I said, well, I didn't learn this about myself, but it, it's really underscored the fact that I thrive off of being around people. And there is something that you lose. And I think, you know, that there is a mix of being able to weave in technology and say, there are times where that's going to work better and make more sense, but you still have to, you, it's hard to build relationships virtually. Um, if you can't go, to lunch, if you can't go have drinks, if you can't meet in person and sit down and look at a, a set of blueprints or plans, it's just not the same. And I think um, I, I probably knew that before now, but I, I think I that much more confident in that belief after all of this. And so, you know, I, it, the problem is that one of the worst things you can do in terms of trust and effectiveness on 
this council, and I presume on any elected body, is surprise each other, catch each other off guard. And I think one of the things that you can avoid, that helps avoid that is when we're all in the office with some regularity, it, you know, the, the fact of the matter is we're not all going to pick up the phone and call 11 other people to talk through every single thing we're thinking about. But when you see somebody in the hallway or you're in a meeting with somebody or you're at an, even just like an in-person event, a ribbon cutting or a groundbreaking or something, and you can be like, Hey, by the way, Hey, I'm going to your... ambush talk tomorrow. Heads up. Yeah. <laughs> you can plan that stuff. Um, and I think that people are probably less likely to be on the offensive against their colleagues if they know they have to face them in person the next day. It it's a lot easier. It's just yeah. the same way that like the people, a lot of the people who say stuff to us, keyboard well, warriors, I mean, us collectively, all of us on social media or whatever, those same people, when you see them out, they don't say that stuff. It's really easy to be tough at a, at a computer screen and a keyboard. Hey, it's in my face. Yeah. <laughs> Just kidding. I mean, the streets. I did um, learn that some people were a little more tough than <laughs> uh, the people guarding my house. Uh, but yeah, I just mean like it's it's that same concept that someone would say something on a computer that they would never say to your face. And I think that people don't feel as uncomfortable attacking each other if they don't think they're going to have to see you at the office the next day. I saw you put on those glasses for audio listeners. Tarek has just put on a set of I'm going to say like Chris Farley glasses. Chris Farley glasses? These are yeah. my very serious blue light computer glasses. And, and I, I saw those so last night more. and I was very confused. You were like, what? Why is that intelligent man speaking so softly for once? <laughs> Why is someone who looks mildly intelligent sitting in Tark's office? I said, you, you said, you always tell me like, hey man, you don't have to yell when you say everything. Well, when I put um, these glasses on, it brings my volume down to a much more calm, studious level like now. And look look how intelligent I seem. Stop it. <laughs> so again, for our audio listeners, I am now holding up a picture that I found in a matter of seconds of Chris Farley in the exact same glasses, making a face that Tark makes. Here, put that up there. Let me make the same face for you. Somebody screen grab this and make oh. a GIF out of it. Oh, well, that's hard to hold that pose. Um, yeah, I mean... Okay. Like, literally, I just Googled Chris Farley glasses. I mean, mm. you're basically the same guy. Handsome man. We need to get you a little coat. I got plenty. <laughs> you actually have that jacket. I do. It's one of my good suits. Well, uh, Larkin, I think we probably covered it, right? I mean, we got a big legislative agenda we're working on. I was appointed to the uh, House Select Committee on Criminal Justice Reform. Uh, you are working on overhauling uh, criminal justice in the city of Charlotte. Uh, we are still working on recovery post-COVID for businesses and workforce. And you know, we've got a lot of people in the hospitality industry uh, that listen to this podcast. Our, our food and beverage uh, business grants have gone live as of I think as of yesterday. Do you need to get yes. the door? <laughs> yeah, someone's at my door, but uh, that's all right. We're recording a podcast, so. Does the councilman live here? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know if they're if they if they're happy to see me or angry to see me. It's always a, a roll. Yeah, they're the going to be like, like, "Hey, we heard what you said about the zoo. Come on out here." <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so they're knocking. So I do think I'm going to have to get it. So all right, um, well, this was episode 103, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. A perfect end. Uh, like, subscribe, share, and you know what, Larkin. Let's make a, a pinky promise to each other right now. We're going to start regular. doing this more often, more yes. regular, like there. really like fiber in the diet. Okay, there's they are still knocking at my door. So, okay. Okay. Thanks for listening. Next time. I'm going to keep recording just in case he gets killed. I'm with the U.S. Census Bureau. We sent you a census form, but you failed to return it to us. My mail is piled up like crazy. Yeah. Well, I just need to uh, fill out this census form with you. Great. Okay. Um, how many people live in this residence? Oh, boy. That's a good question. <laughs> I'm bad with numbers. Maybe 80. 80 people live in this apartment? Seems high, doesn't it? Not 80. How about four? I don't know. 
know. I'm so bad at guesstimating. <laughs> well, why don't you just take your time and count? Okay. There's me, my wife, our plants. We have some candy bars. <laughs> well, you know, we don't count candy bars or plants. Yeah. Then there's just the two of us. <laughs> Boy, I really overshot it with the 80, didn't I? <laughs> Listen, don't worry about it, okay? I'm going to put you down as the primary resident, okay? Yeah. Um, now, are you currently employed? Yeah, part of the time. <laughs> well, you, you work part-time. How many days a week? Every day, but just part of the day, from 9 to 5. <laughs> so you work a full day? I wouldn't say that. There are huge chunks of time at night where I, I'm just asleep. <laughs> Hours, it, you know, it's it's ridiculous. Are you still there? Oh, we've been recording the whole time. This is going to be part of the episode, unfortunately. Did you hear me? Oh yeah, yeah, we heard it all. I well, was actually, perfect reminder that we only have eight days left in the census, and so for anybody who has not filled out their census, check with your friends, your family. North Carolina has severely underreported in the census, and that might not sound that significant, but again, North Carolina stands to get a 14th congressional representative after this census, and tons of federal dollars are tied to the census data, and North Carolina will lose out, and Mecklenburg County and Charlotte and wherever you live in North Carolina will lose out on millions and millions of dollars if we underreport the census, and we are uh, way behind where we should be with only eight days left to go. So that was someone coming to double check on the two houses under construction behind me and whether someone was living there on April 1st, they were not, uh, which I already told them, but they are double checking their work, which I guess is a good thing. What's uh, what's his name? Christopher Walken. Hold on, dude. This just reminded me. Uh, and you can go to 2020census.gov if you need to complete your census. 